Good morning, everyone. It's really a great pleasure and honor to have Ambassador Mike Froman with us today to, for him to address the issue of trade and development, particularly in the African context. As you all know, he's the United States Trade Representative, which is being uh, the principal advisor to President Obama on trade matters, on investment matters, and the spokesperson also for the United States on trade. The event is organized by the Brookings Africa Growth Initiative, which is an initiative that tries to bring Africa's voice to Washington, strengthen ties between economic ties between the United States and Africa, and all this done you know, on the basis of research, fact-based analysis, and not just advocacy, although the advocacy part is also very important. It's really an honor, Mike Ambassador Froman, to have you with us. Um, I'll just read a few points on, on your, of your stellar CV and then say a few personal words about it, too. Uh, prior to becoming USTR, Ambassador Froman served at the White House as Assistant to the President and as Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economic Affairs. Among other things, he served as the U.S. Sherpa for the G20 and G8 summits. And the, those summits have great moments, but very, very tough moments. <laughs> and staffed the president for the APEC leaders meeting. In addition, he chaired or co-chaired the major economic, economies forum on energy and climate, the Transatlantic Economic Council, the U.S. India CEO forum, and the U.S. Brazil CEO forum. Prior to joining the Obama administration, Ambassador Froman served in a number of roles at, the, at Citigroup and as a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and as a resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Before that, again in government, in the 1990s, Ambassador Froman spent seven years uh, at the Treasury and at the White House. He received his bachelor's degree in public and international affairs from Princeton University, a doctorate in international relations from Oxford, and a law degree from Harvard Law School, where he was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. He was born in California, and he thinks the California summer has some advantages over the uh, DC summer, he told me. Uh, he and his wife, Nancy Goodman, and their two living children, Ben and Sarah, reside in Washington, DC. I've had the privilege of knowing Ambassador Froman for quite a while. No, no need to t say the exact number of years. But I want to say uh, one major thing, uh, and I, I really feel it, I think it's important. I don't know whether Alan, Professor Alan Leiner was my teacher at Princeton, was also your teacher, Mike, but he has, he's coined this phrase, a hard head and a soft heart. And I think it fits Mike Froman perfectly. A very hard head, tough, analytical, but also a soft heart. And I think you need both to be in public service and, and to, to try to reach the goals, particularly set um, by the United States and Africa for their cooperation within the framework of AGOA. Trade is potentially a win-win situation, uh, but you have to structure it right, you have to do it right, so that everybody can indeed benefit. And I think that's uh, for Africa, but also worldwide, uh, the goal that Ambassador Froman has set for himself and for the United States. So with that, let me welcome him again. Thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Kamal. And uh, I will say that I've known Kamal for 22 years. I, I will put the years on it. When my wife and I and Kamal were traipsing around Albania, working on development issues when the first democratically elected government of that country came into, came into being. And Kamal has been a, a good friend and a, uh, a great source of advice and guidance on development policy ever since. So I'm very grateful for, uh, for being here and for, for sharing uh, the podium with Kamal. You know, Martin Luther King once said, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. And nowhere is that more clear than in the world of development. Uh, we need to work at it. And that's why for the last 70 years, the United States has consciously opened up its market, even at times asymmetrically, to help war-torn countries rebuild and poor nations develop. We've done that not only because it's consistent with our values, but also because we have an interest in the stability that comes with poverty alleviation 
and the new markets that come from the emergence of a global middle class. But much has changed over this period, and we face a host of consequential choices about the future of US trade policy and global development, including updating and renewing preference programs, such as the African Growth and Opportunity Act, or AGOA, and the Generalized System of Preferences, or GSP. With stakes this high, the time is right to re-examine the relationship between trade and development and recommit to a trade policy that will drive broad-based global growth in the 21st century. And no time is more appropriate than now, as we prepare to host 50 African heads of state and government for the first ever US-Africa Leaders Summit to discuss how we can work together to boost growth and prosperity on both our continents. And as we seek to move beyond the barriers that divide our nations, it's worth remembering that trade is part of a history that we all share. According to anthropologists, the ability to trade across long distances is one of the traits that separates us from other species. From the laying of the Silk Road to the rise of the great trading states like the Ghanaian Empire to the discovery of the New World, trade has always been central to development. And the link between trade and development has never been stronger than during our most recent chapter of world history. Since World War II, the United States has been one of the principal architects of a global trading system founded on the principles of openness, fairness, and freedom. And through that system, we've seen time and again how trade advances global development by promoting growth and alleviating poverty. Here are a few of the most recent milestones from what's been an era of unprecedented progress. Between 1991 and 2011, developing countries' share of world trade doubled, rising from 16% to 32%. During the same period, nearly one billion people were lifted out of poverty. In the mid-1990s, foreign direct investment flows to developing countries grew to surpass official aid flows. And last year, ushered in another first. The value of trade between developing countries exceeded that between, of, the, of the trade between developing and developed countries. Looking at the historical record, it's clear that while trade alone cannot solve every development challenge, it's a necessary part of any successful and sustainable development strategy. And the literature on this is clear. Trade fuels faster growth, facilitates investment, reduces poverty in developing countries with more jobs and increased incomes for the poor. Trade allows countries to import cutting edge technologies and inputs at lower prices. It drives domestic firms to become more competitive and encourages efficient resource allocation and specialization. For small countries with no trade, there's very little scope for large scale capital investment and limited prospects for specialization. Without export markets, the production of many goods are economically unviable, but with trade, those countries have broader possibilities. Higher growth, more employment, and higher incomes also create more resources with which to finance investments in anti-poverty programs and pr provide citizens with better access to public services. And this virtuous cycle depends on a number of other factors, such as institutions, rule of law, investment in infrastructure and education, but it breaks down when trade is not part of the equation. Take Singapore's remarkable rise. When it became independent in 1965, Singapore had a small domestic market little or no natural resources, and a GDP per capita of $516. Today, Singapore is consistently ranked among the least corrupt, most open, and most business-friendly economies in the world. And contrast this path with the choices of Venezuela, which in 1965 had a GDP per capita more than twice that of Singapore, but is now one of the least open economies in the world. Last year, Singapore's GDP per capita was around $55,000 a roughly 100-fold increase since 1965, while Venezuela's was less than $15,000, notwithstanding its abundant resources. Now, there are a lot of factors that go into this, but openness to trade was certainly among them. As Chile's experience demonstrates, openness to trade makes firms more competitive by encouraging efficient resource allocation, both within firms and within the greater economy. During the late 1970s and early 1980s, Chile opened its economy to trade, and as a result, Chile's export and import competing sectors increased their aggregate productivity by roughly 20% and 25% more than non-traded goods sectors. Between 1980 and today, Chile has reduced its poverty rate by 75% and raised its life expectancy at birth by a decade. And in recent years, of course, the biggest development story of all has been China. 
After China began opening to international commerce, its annual GDP growth increased from 4% between 1949 and 1978 to an average of nearly 10% since 1979. This sustained growth lifted 680 million people out of poverty between 1981 and 2010, roughly three quarters of the world's total poverty alleviation during that period. We welcome the rise of a stable, peaceful, and prosperous China that upholds the rules-based trading system, not only because human welfare rises with it, but also because as China's domestic demand grows and as it continues to open its economy to fair competition, American workers, farmers, ranchers, and businesses will find more customers among China's 1.3 billion population and burgeoning middle class. Take the first class of graduates from the GSP program, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Israel, Mexico. Despite their differences, each of these nations chose trade as a key part of their economic strategies. And a few, days, a few decades later, all are development success stories. They're all significant markets and close partners of the United States. Their citizens enjoy higher standards of living, their industries are more globally competitive, and they're better able to contribute as responsible members of the international community. Indeed, witness the distinction between Asia and much of the Middle East. One region has seen an explosion of trade and integration and significant achievements on virtually all indices of development. And over the same period, the other remained one of the least economically integrated regions of the world and has seen much less pronounced progress on the various dimensions of development. Of course, in seeking development, it's not enough to push just for increased growth. We must seek development that is broad-based and inclusive. We must seek development that is sustainable. And that's why raising standards is a key objective of our trade policy. Our preference programs are conditions on a beneficiaries having rule of law, fundamental protections of workers, and basic good government principles in place. And our efforts to negotiate high standard agreements with Asia Pacific and European partners are focused on securing the strongest labor and environmental provisions of any agreements ever signed. Examples like the garment sector in Bangladesh are a cautionary tale, reminding us that trade works for development when its benefits are broadly shared. If workers have no voice and toil in desperate and unsafe conditions, whether in Dhaka or Phnom Penh, the promise of trade will remain unfulfilled. Clearly, more must be done. Extreme poverty persists with, for more than 1.2 billion people. Inequality has increased within developing countries, even as average incomes have increased. And population growth threatens to outpace the ability of some governments to provide basic services for some economies and for some economies to provide sufficient opportunities for its people, particularly for its young. Moreover, any path forward must account for three changes that are reshaping the world and revising the relationship between trade and development. The first of these changes is the rise of the emerging economies. They've benefited enormously from the openness and predictability of the global rules-based trading system. And as their role in that system increases, it's only appropriate that the responsibilities for it do so as well. With the increasing importance of South-South trade and global investment flows, not only are these countries better able to provide for their own citizens, but they also have an increased role to play in contributing to the development of their poor neighbors as well. Second, as it has throughout history, technological change is presenting new challenges and opportunities for global trade and development. Even excluding China, developing country internet usage has risen by over 1 billion users since 2000, and mobile telephone use has grown even faster. In a world of increased connectivity, farmers and small businesses in remote areas are more able to access market information and reach foreign customers than ever before. And this creates new opportunities to expand trade, promote inclusive growth, and address major development challenges. The third and related change is the importance of looking broadly at all the factors that impact trade. During 1990 to 2010, through multilateral and plurilateral tariff negotiations, and as a result of the WTO accession process, average MFN applied tariff rates decreased by roughly two-thirds. Add to that the development of preference programs and the proliferation of FTAs that eliminate tariffs, and it's clear that non-tariff barriers to trade and supply-side constraints on competitiveness play an increasingly important role in determining whether and how trade will contribute to development and poverty alleviation. When held up 
against the long arc of history, it's clear that the change is occurring at an unprecedented pace. Yet the potential for trade to drive global development remains as strong as ever. To better realize that potential, we need to update our approach to trade and development as well. President Obama's trade agenda brings traditional policy tools into the 21st century and offers a more comprehensive look at development. This agenda is formed by hard-headed, honest assessments of trade's potential to contribute to development, as well as its limits. To begin with, we're working with Congress to reauthorize GSP and to update and extend AGOA, which has been the cornerstone of our trade policy with Sub-Saharan Africa since 2000. Under AGOA, exports, exports to the United States have tripled, and as AGOA countries improve their business and investment climates, the stock of US FDI has almost quadrupled. AGOA has also supported the diversification of sub-Saharan economies. Since 2001, non-oil, non-mineral exports under AGOA to the United States have increased almost fourfold. But at only $5 billion, there is much room for growth. 2,300 years ago, Aristotle observed that there is always something new coming out of Africa. And over the last 14 years, Thanks in part to AGOA, we've seen a lot that's new coming out of Africa. To name just a few, between 1999 and June 2011, Lesotho expanded its manufacturing jobs almost threefold. Between 2011 and 2013, Ethiopian shoe exports under AGOA increased more than 30-fold. And last year, South Africa exported more than $2.2 billion in AGOA motor vehicles and parts. AGOA has been good for America as well. Since 2000, U.S. goods exports to Sub-Saharan Africa increased fourfold, from $6 billion to $24 billion. Last year, U.S. exports to Sub-Saharan Africa supported nearly 120,000 jobs here in the United States. And given that Africa is home to the world's fastest growing middle class and six out of the 10 fastest growing economies, it's easy to see while companies like GE, Caterpillar, Procter & Gamble increasingly view engaging with Africa not as a choice, but as a necessity. Behind the growing commercial ties between America and Africa are real people, countless families and communities who have benefited from AGOA. There's the story of Fashionable, a Nashville-based company that employs vulnerable women in Ethiopia, many of them former sex workers, to produce high-quality scarves and leather products. According to Barrett War, the company's founder, the solutions to poverty do not lie in developing a business model that gives 10% of its profits to charity. The solutions are in developing businesses that do trade with Africa, tying them into the worldwide economy and giving them manufacturing opportunities. Fashionable has relied on AGOA to reduce the costs of selling its products in the United States in the highly competitive fashion industry. And for the remarkable women behind those products who were able to support themselves and their loved ones in a life of dignity, AGOA is much more than a trade policy. There's Rhonda Filfili from Senegal, who's expanded her, company's, her family's company, Xena Fr Exotic Fruits, to sell processed fruits to over 200 wholesale companies to serve markets in Europe and the United States. Ms. Filfili takes pride in producing a competitive product while giving her 40 employees, 90% of whom are women, a safe and non-discriminatory workforce. Ms. Filfili's story and the numerous others like hers are to be celebrated, but there's much work to be done. For too many African businesses, regulatory complexity, weak infrastructure, and other capacity challenges have kept the prospect of exporting under AGOA out of reach. That's why I've traveled to Africa four times over the last two years, and why we've launched a year-long comprehensive review of AGOA. We've been talking to African and US leaders, ministers, large and small businesses, academics, think tanks, and NGOs to determine what's worked well and what needs to be changed. And as a result, we believe there are many ways to upgrade, upgrade AGOA, including by renewing AGOA and its third country fabric provisions for a sufficient period of time to encourage meaningful investment and sourcing, by expanding AGOA's coverage while taking into account sensitivities here at home, by simplifying the rules of origin to make it easier for African firms to export to the United States while promoting further production in Africa, and by updating AGOA's eligibility criteria and review processes to ensure that we're raising standards in Africa and have greater flexibility to enforce those standards. 
The specific parameters of a GOA are, of course, ultimately a prerogative of Congress. And we look forward to working with Congress to put in place a program that reflects the reality of Africa's rise. But perhaps the clearest lesson from AGOA over the last 14 years is that market access, while important, simply isn't enough. For Sub-Saharan Africa to deliver on the promise of being an emerging economy, we must deal with the supply side constraints that infringe on Africa's ability to compete and integrate successfully in the global trading system. Here too, the academic literature is clear. Tariff preferences are not enough. We must address the impact of surrounding constraints. For the United States, this requires a comprehensive whole of government trade and investment strategy with a renewed AGOA at its core and the support of both the public and private sectors on both continents. An AGOA compact that brings together our collective resources and puts us on a common course to trade-led growth and development. It requires hard infrastructure, roads, ports, and very importantly, access to affordable, reliable electricity. USAID, MCC, OPIC, EXIM, and TDA are active in this area, including by driving Power Africa. It requires trade capacity building, technical assistance to implement critical standards, including by training local laboratories and inspectors to meet sanitary and phytosanitary standards so that African farmers can export more of their product to global markets. It means providing training and support for young entrepreneurs, such as the participants in the Young African Leaders Program and the African Women's Entrepreneurship Program, and for small businesses through enhanced trade hubs so that they can take better advantage of market opportunities. It requires soft infrastructure or trade facilitation, single border crossings, consistent customs procedures, IT systems that allow customs organizations to share information so that when a shipment is cleared in Mombasa or Dar es Salaam, it doesn't have to be re-cleared by the customs officials of each country in the East African community whose territory it traverses. Unfortunately, a couple countries now appear to, revisiting, to be revisiting their commitment to implement the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement later this week. The first fully multilateral trade agreement in the WTO's history, the TFA would make border procedures more efficient, and in doing so, cut trade costs by almost 14.5% for developing countries and 10% for developed countries. We're hopeful about achieving a consensus because alongside the economic stakes, the credibility of the WTO as an institution rests on the swift implementation of the trade facilitation agreement. Bali breathed new life into the multilateral trading system, and it would be short-sighted, especially for a couple developing countries, to block the implementation of the trade facilitation agreement this week, putting at risk again the continued viability of the multilateral trading system and undermining the development efforts of so many countries reliant on that system. Addressing Africa's supply side constraints is critical, but there's more that can be done to create demand and build markets as well. Creating market demand at scale by deepening regional integration is important, and our support for those efforts, including our work with the East African community to develop a regional investment arrangement is key. Demand can also be promoted through the type of public-private partnerships we've developed in the context of Power Africa and the new Alliance on Food Security and Nutrition. Of course, we're not operating in a static world. As Africa enters into reciprocal trade arrangements with the EU, for example, trading relationships begin to change. European companies have preferential access to Africa's markets, while we're giving African firms preferential access to the US market. In addition, the EU and Canada have each revised their GSP program to adjust to the rise of emerging markets. We needed to take these developments into account as we consider our approach going forward. Indeed, as we look to the next chapter of US trade and investment relations with Africa, and as Africa itself furthers its efforts to deepen its integration, first as regional economic communities, and ultimately in the, in the context of a continent-wide free trade area, we need to think through how our trade relationship with Africa might evolve from one built around a unilateral preference program to a more reciprocal set of arrangements over the medium and long term. This isn't every country's approach to trade and development. Some go into developing countries more focused on taking resources out of those countries than on investing in human resources in them. It's important that we remain fully engaged and deliver on this comprehensive trade and investment strategy to demonstrate that there is a better way. As President Obama said in Africa last year, 
We seek a new kind of relationship, a partnership rooted in equality and shared interests. Next week, when the President gathers 50 heads of state and government for an historic U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, defining the next generation of trade and investment relations will be at the center of their discussion. It's an important moment for Africa, for the United States, and for our continuing efforts to further development through trade and investment. Thanks very much. You, but okay. Amadou C is the Senior Fellow of the African Growth Initiative. Thank you very much. And you have a chat before we open it to the floor. Thank you again, uh, Ambassador Froman, for a very comprehensive review of uh, U.S. policy uh, when it comes to trade with Africa, um, taking us back all the way to the empire of Ghana, so <laughs> that's appreciated. Uh, if you are on Twitter, please um, use hashtag uh, Africa Summit. Um, so I'll just start with a couple of questions. Um, I would have to say uh, that's a difficult task for me, given the comprehens comprehensiveness of the, of the speech, but I'll give it a try. So we've had uh, 14 years of AGOA. Um, this has been since 2000. Um, and it, AGOA is uh, set to expire in 2015. And um, there's a lot of um, anxiety from um, different uh, stakeholders. Uh, you were in Addis Ababa in 2013 for the AGOA Forum, and you've heard from um, the African policymakers um, that they would like AGOA to be renewed as soon as possible. Uh, I'm sure you hear from the, the private sector too. Uh, um, so could you guide us a little bit um, in, in the process to have AGOA renewed? We are not far from 2015. And um, it would be uh, um, useful to have a sense of how um, the issue is progressing. Sure. Well, the program is set to expire at the end of September 2015. And it's one reason why we launched the review of AGOA uh, just about a year ago, so that we would be able to take that period of time, take the input from a wide range of stakeholders, uh, and be able to come to some conclusion about the kind of recommendations that we'd like to make to Congress uh, regarding its renewal. Uh, we're looking forward to next week's uh, AGOA Forum meeting, the AGOA Ministerial, which will be held on, on Monday, and the uh, Leaders' Summit, very importantly, that will be held on Tuesday as a way of, of uh, kicking off our discussion of AGOA renewal. Um, again, AGOA is ultimately a prerogative of Congress. Uh, it's Congress's uh, responsibility uh, to define the parameters of AGOA, but we very much look forward to working uh, with them to, uh, to make sure that there is a seamless renewal of AGOA uh, as soon as possible. We've already begun having conversations uh, on the Hill. We've been consulting with uh, relevant committees and, and relevant members, and I'm pleased to say that AGOA is an area where there is bicameral, bipartisan uh, support, and there are uh, a number of members who are very uh, eager to move forward with, uh, with a GOA renewal and look forward to engaging on the substance of that uh, with us. And we very much look forward to engaging with them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The second question um, relates to the performance of AGOA. Um, as you said, as you said uh, U.S. imports uh, from Africa has uh, tripled from about um, 8 billion in 2000 to about 25 billion now, um, with a peak of 50 billion in 2008. Um, but most of it uh, is oil, 
And um, actually, you've seen uh, oil from Nigeria um, going down a little bit with uh, all the new discoveries in the, in the US and the fracking and so on. But the question is uh, um, about the potential. Like the US ITC has identified a number of uh, areas. I like the cut flowers example. Um, and um, so could you tell us a bit about um, the initiatives, the progress, and the, the efforts sure. being done in that regard? Sure. Yeah. Well, as you say, uh, uh, US imports uh, from AGOA countries tripled when you take out uh, oil and minerals. They've gone up about fourfold, uh, from 1.4 billion to almost uh, almost five billion. But that is still relatively modest, and we want to see that grow as we take a goa forward. And that's why we want to take a comprehensive approach to trade and investment with Sub-Saharan Africa, and recognize that it's not just the tariff issues, but the supply side constraints that also contribute to the competitiveness of products coming out of goa countries and their ability to. Uh, succeed in, in the global marketplace. Issues like hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure, capacity building. Um, with regard to the tariffs themselves, for LDCs in AGOA, 97.5% of all tariffs are duty-free. Tariff lines are duty-free. Mm -hmm. There are about 316 remaining tariff lines that still have a duty on them. Uh, some of those are very sensitive products to the U.S. market, uh, but we think that there is some room for looking at, at those 316 lines. Uh, in, in, in collaboration with Congress to determine whether there are, uh, whether there is additional tariff coverage that, that might be possible. Um, but even expanding the tariff coverage, it's very important that we deal with these other issues. Uh, roads, ports, electricity, uh, customs and trade facilitation, uh, the single, uh, single IT systems that can talk to each other, taking out costs out of the system. And as we know, uh, and there's been a number of studies on this, a, a container of products coming out of Africa mm -hmm. sometimes cost two or three times as much to transport as an equivalent container of product coming out of, of parts of Latin America or Asia. And if Sub-Saharan Africa is going to compete on the global marketplace in these areas, we need to take out those costs. And that's why the Trade Facilitation Agreement agreed to at the WTO mm -hmm. and being debated this week in Geneva uh, is, particularly, uh, is particularly important. Mm -hmm. This may be a last question uh, regarding Europe. So, the European Union and the U.S. have different strategies when it comes to trade with Africa. Uh, reciprocity uh, is, is something that the U.S. is not asking, whereas um, the EPA require uh, something back in return, opening up um, African markets for European companies. So when you look at uh, basically, I, I see that you've, you were at the German Marshall uh, Fund. <laughs> so. Um, how does um, these differences in strategy um, affect or could affect um, uh, AGOA renewal? Well, I think this is something we're going to need to, to, to look at, as, as I mentioned in the, in the speech, because uh, on one hand, we're providing unilateral access for African products to the U.S. market. Uh, on the other hand, our companies uh, face, in various markets, uh, significant tariff barriers while European firms may have preferential access there. And that, over time, is not a sustainable situation. You know, there are there also, there's a wide range of uh, country situations in, among the AGOA countries. And it may be possible over time to move towards a more reciprocal relationship uh, or to move off of preference programs with some of the, uh, with some of the current AGOA members. But that's a, a dialogue that we need to begin having. Even as we renew AGOA now, we need to be having that dialogue about the future of our trade investment relationship with Sub-Saharan Africa and how it might evolve to take into account uh, the developments you mentioned as well as others. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would like to open, uh, open it to the floor now. Uh, I think we have time for um, maybe three questions or so. Yeah. So I'll take this one, take that one. Victoria Guido with Inside U.S. Trade. Um, I, Ambassador Froman, you made a sort of reference to this, but I wanted to ask you more directly, uh, is there the potential to cover agricultural products that are currently covered by tariff rate quotas um, under AGOA? Um, and then my second question is uh, on, on South Africa, um, is, is that something, that reciprocity discussion, is that something that is, uh, that is happening now in terms of when that might happen? You know, I think, uh, as I mentioned, there are for, for the LDCs in AGOA, there are 316 tariff lines that are not included. 
Uh, those tend to be in the agriculture and, and textile area. And some of those products are um, extremely sensitive from an import perspective in the US, and uh, we would not intend on opening those up. But I think it bears some work to look line by line to see whether there are lines that could be opened up without um, violating sensitivities. And that's a process, again, we'd have to work with Congress on. It's Congress's prerogative, ultimately, uh, ultimately to do that. I think with regard to South Africa, certainly this is um, an area where this issue of um, differential access, for example, between our companies and European companies, uh, has come to a head and where issues about barriers to uh, the South African market um, have, have garnered a lot of attention. And so uh, that is an area where we would like to have a dialogue with our South African partners and determine how best to move forward, even as we look at the renewal of AGOA, how do we move forward bilaterally to address some of our outstanding trade issues. Mm -hmm. And I'll take a question from that side, yeah. Back Femi Akibi, I'm a Nigerian. My question, the undercurrent in the continent is that people there think that the U.S. is using a back entrance uh, in regards to China beating the U.S. into the mineral resource in Africa. And my second question is, do we have any new instrument to finance long-term infrastructure development in the continent? Thank you. Uh, to make sure, I want to make sure I, I answer the question directly. I think in our view, um, and I think the president said this very well when he was in Africa last year. Africa ought to have trade and investment relationships with, with every country. Um, and it's really up to Africa to determine what the nature of those relationships are and what relationships and, and what the rules of the road should be that work best uh, for it. Uh, we have a particular approach to development and we want to make sure that we're in, investing in, in resources in the country. That's why we're focused, for example, this week on having young African leaders here in Washington for training programs to help build human capacity. Uh, it's why we're invested so much in the Power Africa initiative to try and bring affordable um, sources of energy and reliable sources of energy uh, to the continent. Uh, but every country will take its own approach and it's really up to Africa to determine how best it wants to pursue its own, its own uh, uh, development. With regard to infrastructure, uh, we are working in, and again, I'll focus on, uh, on Power Africa as an example, uh, where we have OPIC, XM, uh, and a variety, and we're working closely with the multilateral development banks uh, to finance that part of the infrastructure uh, puzzle. And we think there is great potential and great private sector interest to work closely with the private sector in building out energy capacity and distribution in Africa. Say the name twice. Steve Landing, Manchester Trade. Always a pleasure to hear the ideas put together. This is a great beginning. How they are filled out will be determined, but the fact that you laid them out and every single point that we who have followed or go closely would have raised worth looking at has been looked at in your approach. So we have to see what happens, but it's just great. Two quick points. One, a quick response on the question that was asked about the 316 products. There's a few agricultural products that are going to be liberalized slightly, um, significantly as a result of the Bali Agreement dealing with products which, where the TRQs are not being filled, and some of those products are very important to Africa, so that might be one area where we're heading to liberalization and may be worth looking at. But to, but to yours truly, the, the real big question is that as we move towards free trade agreements, there are two theories. One theory is let the Africans within their own medium term finish creating their own economic groupings and then negotiate, whether it's with the continental FTA, whether it's with the regional agreements, so we can avoid the problems that the efforts have caused where you go after individual countries and it has led to a lot of problems and actually a lot of bad will and the U.S. has certainly is appreciated for our own role. And the other question is, no, let's just start now. So when you say medium term, the question which I think most of us focus on, are we going to allow time for Africa to at least have an opportunity to move towards regional integration? Or do you think that we have to move perhaps faster than that? Thank you, sir. Well, as you, as you point out, there is a great deal of work being done in Africa right now on integration uh, among the regional economic communities and then ultimately across the continent. And I think 
that's part of the conversation that we need to have with our African partners about how what they're doing on regional integration uh, might interact with how our trade policy evolves towards more reciprocal arrangements over time. And so I think that's a, a conversation that we need to begin having and make sure that it works from both perspectives. Barry Wood, MoneyWeb in South Africa. Um, Ambassador Froman, would you say more about the TFA and uh, what other country besides India is uh, blocking this agreement and what are the prospects? Well, uh, first of all, the, the trade facilitation agreement reached in Bali was a critical part of an overall balanced package that was reached in Bali. Uh, within the trade facilitation agreement, it's a balanced agreement. Uh, developing countries can set their own schedules for implementation. Uh, they can identify which, which of their obligations they need technical assistance for in order to deliver. And so we tried to make it as flexible and as possible uh, to accommodate the various interests of, of developing uh, countries and worked with all of the developing countries um, and the various groupings to do that. And at Bali, the Trade Facilitation Agreement was part of a larger agreement that included issues regarding uh, LDCs, issues regarding food security and food stockpiling, and the whole package was accepted unanimously by the membership of the WTO in Bali as a balanced package. Each of the elements of that package had its own work plan and its own timetable. Uh, each element had its own deadline for work. And one of the deadlines coming up is July 31st, Thursday, is the deadline for acceptance of the protocol of amendment for, at the WTO for the trade facilitation agreement. Uh, we are hopeful that there'll be a consensus of support for moving ahead with the acceptance of that, of that protocol. Uh, but there were discussions last week, uh, and, and uh, a, small number, a small number of countries appear to be willing to block that consensus, and we're encouraging them to, um, uh, we're, we're reassuring them that we are fully committed to implementing all of the elements of the Bali package, uh, consistent with the timetables that we all agreed to, and we're encouraging them to join the consensus to allow the protocol to go into effect. Maybe if I, if I can just follow up on that one. From, from some African countries, we hear the message that um, in the principles of, of the TFA are, are, are okay, but they need more resources. They need more help um, in terms of basically um, moving along. Uh, so, so do you see some, some, some support, possible support from the U.S.? I think there's a great deal of support there for that. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, Raj Shah, the administrator of AID, and I convened a meeting in April uh, here around the World Bank IMF meetings with donors, with the multilateral development banks, uh, precisely to talk about how to mobilize resources for technical assistance and make sure that they were coordinated in a fashion to support countries' ability to implement the Trade Facilitation Agreement. And last week, uh, Roberto Acevedo, the Director General of the WTO, announced a new facility there at the WTO mm -hmm. to support, to provide resources for technical assistance on, uh, on trade facilitation. You know, over the last, you know, we, we have been giving, the United States has been uh, a major supporter of, uh, of aid for trade over the last uh, of decade, and, as have other uh, major donors, and we certainly are focused on ensuring that we continue to do that uh, in order to help countries implement their trade facilitation obligations as well. Yeah, I believe the African Development Bank also is thinking yeah. about a facility. Exactly. Yeah, we'll take a couple more questions. Um, yeah. Whitney Schneidman, uh, Brookings and um, Covington. Uh, thanks so much for uh, your great remarks and hitting on uh, a number of key issues. Uh, two points. I just want to, um, on the EPAs, is there scope within TTIP to raise this issue, to uh, talk to the EU about harmonizing the US approach and the EU approach to uh, Africa? And my second point is the trade hubs, which have so much potential to really not only help African companies export to the U.S., but U.S. companies capture part of the African market share. Is there scope for really having them become one-stop shops as it concerns Exim and TDA and um, various um, U.S. agencies, uh, which I think would be really helpful? Thanks. Well, uh, TTIP uh, was intended not only to bring the U.S. and the EU uh, together in terms of their, their markets, but also to create a mechanism where the two of us could 
cooperate vis-a-vis -vis third country issues. We've not yet discussed uh, Africa or our varying approaches to trade relations with Africa, um, but it's certainly something that, uh, that we could discuss going, going forward. Um, in terms of, of the trade hubs, uh, this is an area that we'd like to further develop and see uh, potentially as, as one, as you say, that both helps promote exports from Africa as well as promote investment in Africa and one that can bring together the multiple resources of the government, U.S. government, to create a, uh, an easier, consumer-friendly, uh, one-stop shop uh, for, uh, uh, for support in that regard. And that's one of the areas that we, that we intend to develop. I'm Kathleen Davy, Mystery, Mystery Enterprises Consulting. I'm active in the MENA region, and I'd like to better understand the level of trade and cooperation between the MENA region and the African growth and your work in the AGOA. Well, AGOA has, uh, has traditionally uh, been focused on sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, the MENA region has been considered uh, separate from that. Uh, leaders will be here next week from all of Africa, including, uh, including North Africa. And I imagine there'll be an opportunity to talk about our trade and investment relationship more generally with the whole region. Hi, I'm Mike King with uh, Law Offices of Peter C. Hansen here in DC. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador Froman, for your comments. I wanted to follow up, if I could, um, on the question from, I believe, the Nigerian gentleman that, um, when he asked about what new measures are available to increase investment in trade. Um, of course, you mentioned uh, Power Africa and AGOA, which certainly stimulate the private sector investment. But I wanted to ask you about the viability of uh, investment agreements, new investment agreements, or updated investment agreements in terms of bilateral investment treaties or perhaps regional investment treaties, uh, for example, with um, the East African community. Um, uh, I know China and Canada have signed quite a few of those treaties recently. Uh, there are certain elements of those treaties which have become uh, quite controversial. But I wanted to uh, just ask uh, if there are any discussions going on right now about getting more of those treaties online with the U.S. and with, with African countries or African regions. Thank you. Well, as you, as you uh, probably know, we uh, signed a, a bit uh, with Rwanda um, and had that uh, um, ratified by the Senate uh, early in this administration. Uh, and we are working with the East African community on a regional investment arrangement. We're having a dialogue with them precisely along those lines of how to send a very positive message about the, that regional economic community as a, as a destination uh, for investment. So we're open to having that dialogue. And I imagine that'll be part of the broader dialogue about what kind of reciprocal relationships going forward we want to have in the trade and investment field. Hi, uh, Doug Palmer with Politico. Uh, Ambassador, you laid out a number of ideas today for um, reforming, upgrading um, AGOA. I just wondered, but you talked about the, it's Congress's prerogative right to legislation. I just wondered, will the administration make a formal proposal laying out its ideas for uh, modernizing AGOA? And in, just in terms of uh, South Africa, um, they had expressed concern about this idea of, of graduating you know, countries um, that have reached a certain level of development from, from a GOA. Um, is that an idea that, that, that's sort of on the table for, the, for, for, for reauthorization? Well, we've begun conversations with uh, Congress about uh, AGOA, uh, giving them readouts of our, the results of our review over the, over the last Year, and we look forward to continuing those conversations as they take up uh, the, AGOA, uh, the AGOA renewal effort. Um, again, it's up to Congress and it's their prerogative to, to renew AGOA and to define the parameters of it, uh, but we look forward to having a dialogue with them about how we think it can uh, be upgraded as they, as they consider its renewal. Now, with regard to, to graduation, you know, I mentioned that uh, both the EU and Canada have uh, reformed their GSP programs to take into account uh, the role of uh, the increasing role of emerging economies in the global uh, in the global economy, um, uh, we, that's just one of the many issues we need to take into account as we think through 
how our trade relations with uh, uh, not just Africa, but developing countries around the world might evolve over time. So uh, um, maybe I will take this time to thank again Ambassador Froman for his time and, and very useful remarks. Uh, we always appreciate when um, uh, senior, uh, senior officials talk about Africa in Washington. And if I can just ask you to remain seated uh, while we escort the ambassador, um, I just it won't take long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.